Hello everyone and welcome to our final lecture in the networking class. This covers uh, both a course review and Quick, which is a new development in networking protocols that kind of covers the whole um, uh, set of topics in the class. Last time we talked about mobility and um, the fundamental problem we, we were looking at was, was how, how the internet and IP addressing specific, specifically was designed for a static world in which uh, computers were big and heavy and plugged into the wall and they didn't move around. Of course, nowadays things are totally different with smartphones and, and laptops and so on. Uh, we saw a couple of solutions related to that. Um, one was mobile IP, which gives a moving host, such as a smartphone or a laptop, a permanent home address that can be uh, advertised and used, per, used uh, over a long period of time even while that device is moving around and getting different temporary addresses and a uh, basically the packets arrive at the permanent address uh, to the subnet where the, the permanent address is located the home agent the router there forwards the uh, packet to whatever the current location is of the of that mobile machine and this works through a kind of registration where that mobile machine has to tell uh, the home agent usually through a foreign agent, which is the, the, the router that's connecting to at the moment, um, where it's currently located. That allows the forwarding to happen, right? So it's a pretty simple idea. It adds some inefficiency, of course, because you have packets going to one place before being forwarded, but that um, allows uh, IP addresses to change, but still be able to reach that uh, machine with IP messaging. Um, this is done with a kind of IP tunnel where you have one up IP packet inside of another IP packet, which is the same basic uh, technique we used with um, to tunnel IPv6 traffic through an IPv4 network. We also talked a little bit about smartphone push notifications. These also use the same idea of location registration, where you're telling some central or let's say permanent uh, authority what your current location is if that location tends to change. In the case of the smartphone, the phone moves around, gets different IP addresses, it tells a central push notification server where it is, and then applications, so the servers for those applications that want to send notifications to you, alerts to you, they have to send those through that central push notification server. We also talk a little bit about, um, at the link layer, how we handle mobility moving between um, base stations or uh, cell towers and that's done through a process called handoff where we temper we, we start up communication on a second channel while we're still connected to the first one and um, gradually migrate the connection over to the new channel and, and by the time it's migrated we can close the first one so you know a set of simple concepts I guess um, just to show uh, what it has been done to uh, allow for more, more mobility on the internet okay so as I said, we're going to do a little bit of a review today, and part of that review is going to be covering um, one of the latest developments in networking protocols called Quick. First of all, let's cover some themes that we covered throughout the class. One of them is decentralization. This is a very fundamental aspect of the internet. The internet has very little centrally controlled infrastructure. There's a little bit of central control, but it's just the minimum amount that's needed. So there's the ICANN that controls the distribution of IP addresses and domain names, so uh, Internet Corporation for Assigned Numbers and Names. Numbers and names, numbers are IP addresses, names are domain names. Someone has to make sure that those aren't being uh, used by, those are given exclusively to individual organizations. There also is the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is an organization that helps to develop internet standards. So the protocols we use on the internet have to be agreed upon by someone, so the IETF manages that process. Uh, with a lot of open engagement from the community, leading to RFCs, which are the documents that define the protocols. RFC stands for, of course, Request for uh, Comments. The development of the physical infrastructure of the network, of the internet, the physical links of the internet, are also d developed in kind of an ad hoc way and in, in a decent, without centralized planning. So if a pair of autonomous systems that are located near each other decide that they want to have better connectivity to each other, they can build a link that connects themselves. That's called peering. And that is essentially the, the mechanism through which the internet grows and becomes more tightly connected and faster. Just a bunch of individual internet service providers and tech companies and so on that decide to build links to connect pairs of positions on the internet that were, let's say, probably at that moment, 
before the connection was built had, had less than an ideal connection because it had to go through some other roundabout way. DNS, the domain name service, is also a, a decentralized distributed system following this theme. DNS has 13 root servers um, that actually in turn are implemented by many machines, which give information about where to find top-level domain information. And then there are, are below that there are a domain uh, DNS servers, name servers, and below that subdomain name servers and so on. So it's a hierarchy of servers that give information about what IP addresses map to domain names or vice versa. And it's also caching at the edge. So all those things uh, create a decentralized um, hash table essentially. BGP, Border Gateway Protocol, is the glue of the internet. And that operates in a de decentralized manner using something, uh, a variation of the, the distance vector algorithm, which is used to compute shortest paths on this internet network that's big, but each of the individual actors only has to interact with its neighbors and um, use information from its neighbors to make optimal decisions about reaching anywhere across the, the many hops of the internet, dozens and dozens of, of hops. Finally, um, we, have, we looked at TCP in depth, and if you remember, TCP congestion control was a, may, was a way to um, control the pacing of connections so that we didn't overwhelm the capacity of the network. And we were doing that with observations from the edge of the network, so packet loss observations from, from uh, host to host or client to server. That, those end-to-end -end observations at the edge allowed us to mitigate congestion in the core of the network. Okay, so that was a way, another, that's a type of decentralization as well. Cool. So decentralization is a big topic, a big theme of the internet. Fault tolerance is also important because um, the, the internet is unreliable, or it's, it's, it's allowed to be un unreliable, yet still operate um, effectively. So we, we assume that links and routers are going to be unreliable, that bits can be flipped in, in the messages we send, that packets can be dropped. Um, in some ways, making this assumption, allowing the low-level stuff to be unreliable, is liberating. It, it allows that stuff to be cheap, that the low-level the links to be um, fast and cheap and, and um, have high capacity because you're, you're not super concerned about reliability because at a higher level, in the, the software protocol levels, we implement solutions to deal with that unreliability. So we have bit error checking in multiple layers of, of protocols and multiple headers. We have um, BGP that allows for routes to change if, if links break, so that, that allows for links to go down, routers to go down, and for the network to still survive. Uh, TCP provides delivery confirmation and retransmission of packets, allows for messages to be reordered before they're delivered, so that eliminates any need for the network to make those guarantees about delivery. Instead, we just we deal with it end to end. TLS provides uh, message integrity and authentication so that you know who you're talking to. You can trust that you're talking to who you think you are, even though the router's in the middle. You don't know who they are, and you don't trust them. Uh, again, it's an end-to-end -end solution to security, for security. And finally, we have application layer protocols like HTTP that can indicate um, error codes like uh, you know, 404 not found, 500 internal server errors, so that the servers themselves don't have to um, have ways to indicate when there are problems, and the you know the, the user or the, the the web browser can react accordingly. So many different. These are just some of, of the ways in which uh, we have fault tolerance on the internet. We have um, adaptivity to an unreliable system that works pretty well. We also have separation of concerns, which is you know a general software engineering and, and I guess uh, a general engineering principle really where if we want to do something very, really complex we break it into pieces and s into sub problems we solve those problems separately and then we bring it all together into a big complex solution that works this allows us to tackle bigger problems more easily right break it into pieces divide and conquer we definitely do that with the internet so we have multiple layers of protocols and we talked about them starting with the HTTP layer, which is the kind of top of the stack, moving down to the lowest layer we talked about was the link layer. Link layer, uh, the example we used most frequently was Ethernet, uh, allows for sharing a physical channel with m multiple transmitters and receivers. We also talked about different uh, wireless media access control protocols, like for Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. 
Above that, we have the network layer, which deals with getting packets from a source to a destination across many hops. So you have to figure out what the optimal paths are. And, um, and then once you figure out those paths, you have to implement the forwarding. At the transport layer with TCP in particular, we dealt with many problems, uh, specifically uh, packets arriving out of order compared to how you sent them, packets being dropped and having to be uh, acknowledged and, and retransmitted if they're not acknowledged, controlling the pacing of the connection so we don't overwhelm the network or the receiver, and also multiplexing in the sense that we want to allow multiple connections on a single machine to have multiple applications running and to be able to distinguish the, the messages or I guess assign the messages to the different connections to allow those connections to happen concurrently. We talked recently about TLS as a uh, protocol that a layer of, pro of protocol that adds a lot of security features like encryption and authentication. And we also talked about application layer protocols such as HTTP. HTTP itself has become a layer because a lot of applications are built on top of that. For example, REST APIs use HTTP. HTTP is sort of a, a document fetching uh, client server protocol. It specifies uh, resources with URLs and, and, and response codes, and it has built-in um, protocol specifications like headers to, to define how caching is done, how different types of data are transmitted and recognized, like content types, and also supports things like compression and, and so on. So these are all, so there are a lot of problems that have to be solved for implementing, let's say, a web browser and we, we divide them into different layers. Okay. Now, I, I mentioned already that separation of concerns was one reason why protocols are layered. Networking is a complex problem. It's easier to solve that problem or break it into, into solved problems. Um, that's definitely true, that's important. That's not the only reason protocols are layered though. Another big part of it, this is just for historical reasons. So the lowest level protocols were kind of developed first when we, you know, in the earliest, the earliest kind of networking problems were like, you had two computers and you wanted them to communicate. So you had a wire and two computers and you needed to like have some way to frame the data and send it and recognize that it was received and maybe you had three computers and, and it kind of grew from that. So um, you can see that the years here I put from when these different protocols were developed um, and it goes, you know, 73, 74, 74, 96 and 89, the only uh, case where there's a reordering is that the TLS layer was developed after HTTP, otherwise it's kind of like bottom up. And new protocols were developed whenever, you know, you needed new functionality that wasn't already provided by previous layers. So in, when, when uh, the folks at CERN wanted to develop a way to share um, documentation with hyper with links between them so they wanted to develop the web uh, it didn't make sense to reinvent ways to uh, get packets get data from across multiple hops of the network reinvent ways to frame data reinvent ways to um, transport a large message and in, into having broken it into pieces and reassembling it and controlling the pacing. Those problems had already been solved for earlier web app, for earlier internet applications, like uh, email, for example, was an application that used TCP, but that was way before 1989. So in 1989, when HTTP was uh, conceived, invented, it made sense to just build the, just build the things that you need that were not already provided by previous layers, okay? That's the, the, the simplest way to do it, and also allows you to do it with the best compatibility because you, you can reuse a network that was already built to support email, for example, and, and other applications on, on the internet. So the, the layers uh, coexist, were developed kind of over time, and they, they complement each other. Um, but then within each layer, we also can have competitions or, or coexistence, right? So I just mentioned the fact that HTTP and, and and mail, SMTP, are both application layer protocols that, that operate on top of TCP. Uh, the fact that that's a separate layer means that you can put different things on top of it. That also works below, like for example, you can implement an, uh, the internet using links that are both ethernet and other types of links, like uh, you know satellite radio links, for example, microwave radio links connecting um, 
long distance wireless communication. That can, that's part of the internet. It doesn't necessarily use ethernet. So there's a different kind of uh, packet framing going on for that one link, but then as the packet travels end to end, it's still gonna use IP. Okay. Right, so many layers, many reasons why protocols are layered. But today, in this second half of the lecture, I'm gonna talk about why it sometimes is better to break down those layers, what benefits we get from breaking down those layers. So we're gonna look a little bit about, we're gonna look, get a modern update, look at, um, not the future, but the, the recent past, the past couple of years of internet protocol development in one particular area, particularly for web browsers and for, for um, web pages, web servers. So we talked throughout the class about this layer design, the different layers, what they do. Um, that's important and, and you know correct and good. But um, recently that has started to change. There's been some alternatives because layered designs create constraints. So abstractions are, are helpful, but they also can be harmful if they hide things that you would actually like to control. Um, there's a kind of trade-off between the simplicity that abstraction provides and the power or flexibility you get from having um, low-level control even in, in, in your high-level application, like your web browser, having control over like the pacing of packets, for example. That seems like an absurd thing now that we know that TCP will handle that for us, but maybe we do want the web browser to control that pacing directly, for example. Okay, so the cost of abstraction is that lower layers cannot be controlled by upper layers. Uh, there are some hacks where um, we, we created leaky abstractions, like TCP has connection parameters that allow an application to control some of the things that TCP is doing with like how it breaks packets, data to the stream into packets, like Nagel's algorithm was an example of that. But for the most part, um, the abstraction hides details. And, and we'll see how that, that can be, has become a problem in terms of performance. So we know that nowadays the vast majority of internet traffic is using a layer of four protocols, HTTP, TLS, TCP, and IP. Okay, this is like the core of the internet. This has become the, uh, the new narrow ways to the internet, like in, in the sense that it's the same, same set of protocols are used at the, that stack, although sometimes above HTTP, different choices are made and below IP, different um, choices can be made. So if we can improve performance significantly by combining some of these four protocols, it might be a good idea to do that because it's so common, right? The vast majority of traffic is using this combination. These layers are meant to, are designed to operate independently of the layers above and below. But if, if we, we can, if we think about it, we might be able to find ways to um, tailor each layer to, to, to get some efficiencies by combining them and not make them kind of generic uh, and independent. So this plot on the right-hand side shows the percent of traffic to uh, Google's front-end servers, including things like YouTube, uh, percent that is secure traffic, which is to say using TLS and HTTPS instead of plain unencrypted HTTP. And this plot goes from uh, 2011 to uh, mid-2016, so it's a few years old. But you can see over those few years, that was a period when the uh, adoption of encryption on the internet was pretty uh, dramatic. Uh, it changed dramatically, right? And nowadays it's it's close to 100 percent, or you know, it's it's well over, I would say, 95 percent. So it's even higher. And you'll notice nowadays in web browsers, the interface of a web browser has changed such that if you're visiting an unencrypted site, now there's kind of a warning in the URL uh, bar. In the past, there was no warning because you know, in 2012, you know, it was quite common for web traffic to be unencrypted, you know, more than 80 percent. So you know, there's no reason, of course, it, it's better, you want to show the user if they want to check to see whether it's encrypted, you want to show them uh, like the, that padlock, but it wasn't like a sign of a, da a dangerous thing in the old days uh, to, it wasn't considered dangerous because it wasn't considered standard to, to use encryption. But nowadays it is considered standard. Even a smartphone that has limited uh, compute capacity can very easily do the encryption without, you know, slowing down the, the connection. So why not just do it, right? Um, and it also has become easier for website operators to enable encryption because there's no longer a high cost for getting uh, TLS certificates. For example, uh, the ACME protocol implemented by software like CertBot will allow you to um, 
for free get an SSL certificate, a TLS certificate for your website to enable encryption, whereas it, it, through an automated process of verification, whereas in the past it used to cost like, uh, you know, maybe $50 or $100 to get an SSL certificate that would last for a year. That's, that's another reason why it's changed. Okay, so uh, I've said that the layer design, it, this particular combination of layers is, is common, it is by far the most vast majority of traffic. Maybe we should think about ways to optimize that combination. So QUIC does that. QUIC stands for Quick UDP Internet Connections. This is this figure shows how the traditional stack of HTTP, TLS, TCP has been um, is re replaced by QUIC. It kind of combines these three protocols. And but mainly it combines, it replaces TLS and TCP. H and HTTP, it's you know, quick over or HTTP over quick um, is 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 actually called HTTP version three, which was recently announced. And um, yeah, so it was originally developed by Google starting in 2012. Google, of course, um, has their own browser, Chrome, that they manage, as well as they have a ton of popular backend services. So Google's in a unique position, or was in a unique position, and still is to develop new internet protocols, right? Because if they want to replace TCP and TLS with something else, then um, they can build it into their browser and they can build it into their servers. And then like, you know, suddenly, you know, maybe 50% of internet traffic will start using this new protocol because of all the Android devices and all the Chrome uh, web browsers on desktops and all the um, traffic that's going in particular to uh, Google web servers. So as of late 2018, so a, little, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, five to 10% of internet traffic uh, was quick. It's probably more nowadays because it's become, it's actually official, like I said, it was officially approved by the um, IETF as a, to be on track to replace HTTP version 3 is the latest standard, so it's becoming um, the standard protocol for HTTP, standard transfer protocol for HTTP. QUIC is based on a previous transfer protocol called Speedy and um, HTTP 2. So these are both prior efforts which we haven't talked about in the class yet, so we're kind of in the project, you implemented HTTP 1.0 and uh, HTTP 1.1 and 1.2 uh, uh, or well, 1.1 is not that different than 1.0, which adds adds some more features like chunking and more headers. HTTP 2 is a little bit different. Uh, this lecture will also introduce that in the concept in the context of Quick, which which goes even further than HTTP 2. Okay, but the the point is that, the, that these protocols, Quick and the predecessors, Speedy and HTTP 2, solve problems that are caused by abstracting and isolating network layers. Okay. This will become more clear in, in the the next few slides. But. I'll show, I'll show. And notice that it's implemented on top of UDP. So the, the way that Quick replaces TCP is by using UDP directly to implement reliable transport. Okay. So why UDP? UDP allows user level applications to control each packet. If you think back to the project two that you did, you that's what you did exactly. You implemented a reliable transport in an application. That's exactly what Google Chrome does, actually. So Quick wanted to be able to uh, develop a new transport protocol without having to uh, modify the operating system TCP library. So the advantage of implementing a new transport protocol on top of UDP is that you can just deploy it as an application. You don't the users who who want to use it don't need like root level or administrative level access to um, install a patch to their operating system. You don't need to have the cooperation of the operating system. You just can deploy an application like Google's Chrome browser that includes uh, this new protocol as long as that application, like any application should, uh, have has access to UDP. Right? UDP is kind of a standard networking thing that the OS gives you. Now, it might be, in an ideal world, maybe Quick should have been implemented as an alternative to UDP and TCP, because that's, that's kind of what it is. It's a, it's a new transport protocol. And that would mean it would it would it was implemented directly on top of the IP layer, but um, that would 
that would require that would be really disruptive and it would be incompatible with old, old hardware that only viewed the networking world as being just UDP or TCP. So existing routers and firewalls and NATs and other middle boxes have rules about how they treat traffic and those rules expect traffic to be either UDP or TCP and there might be different rules for the two of them. If you suddenly have this new kind of traffic that's quick, that's neither UDP nor TCP, then the you know the firewalls might start to block that traffic, things like that, right? So you know, in an ideal world, you would deploy a new, you would define a new protocol. Everyone would say, "This is great. We're all going to use it. We're all going to upgrade every piece of every router, every firewall, every operating system in the world is going to is going to start using it." But in you know, in the real world, that would never happen. That's that's too complex, right? So. That was one of the lessons that the quick developers learned from IP version six. IP version six, as you'll remember, was kind of incompatible with IP version four. Like it was a separate uh, internet with different numbers and required routers to be upgraded. And the adoption for IP version six has been very slow. So it's taken more than 20 years, even though everyone knows that um, it would be a good thing to have more IP addresses. But it's, it's not compatible with old hardware, so you have to have these tunnels and things to, to get around with it. So Quick, by contrast, does not require any anyone to do anything for it to work, because it works as the application layer as long as you have a compatible server and a compatible client a web browser, it can work. Okay. So I haven't really explained the motivation for Quick yet. I've said that that having separate layers for these different protocols creates problems, but now we're going to talk about what those problems are. There's, I think, four different problems we're going to talk about, and, and Quick solves all of them. So the first one is that if you're using both TCP and TLS together, you have two handshakes at the beginning of the connection before you can get started. Okay, so this picture shows that. First, we have the TCP handshake, which is the SYN, SYNAC, and AC. Uh, kind of like round takes one round trip to do that, right? Once that's done, then you can start your TLS handshake, which involves an exchange of um, keys and, and, and cipher specs and things like that. So you have you actually have two round trips before you can start your application. Like if you're fetching a web page, your web request is this black line down here after two round trips. Um, that's bad because I mean, theoretically, you could have combined the two, and that's what Quick does. We'll see in a second. Um, round trip latency is never going to get faster because it's mostly determined by the speed of light. So, if we think about future applications, you know, as as demands get higher and higher for uh, you know faster and more responsive applications, um, we we really want to think carefully about minimizing round trips. Uh, because those, those round trips are always going to be costly. We can't make the speed of light any faster. We can't move data really any faster than we, we are right now in terms of latency, the time it takes for a bit that we generate here to arrive uh, across the world. So two handshakes is a problem. What Quick does is it you know combines both the cryptographic information exchange and the TCP handshake, remember the TCP handshake was setting up sequence numbers and uh, initial receive window sizes and things like that. You can just combine that information into one handshake. Basically, like the client has a bunch of information it needs to tell the server or, you know, the, this the host one and host two. You can just send it all at once in the first packet and then get all the response at once from, from the second packet. And the first uh, slide on the left shows that how that works. It's called a, um, sorry, client hello is the, is the packet that's sent first by the client. And in the, in the worst case scenario, Quick can establish a connection and start sending a, a request after one round trip. Okay, so this, this combines both the TCP and uh, TLS handshake. Now, it actually can do better than that. There's a, a form of connection establishment called a zero round trip handshake, which is what is shown on the, in the middle and, and, and on the, which is why we have three pictures here instead of just one. Um, if you're contacting a server that you have already, have recently contacted, then you, you, you might remember the long, the public key from before, from the previous connection. And you might be able to use a sequence number that um, 
actually I'm not sure how the sequence numbers are determined but if you have some way to, to set up a sequence number I guess if you're using encryption then the need for a random sequence number is less important um, but you can generate your own uh, the sequence number for your direction of the connection and send that in the request so if, if you already have a public key from before you can actually send your data in the first request and that's called a complete client hello here and the server can respond and of course when the server responds it can renegotiate the key and, and, and give, say okay you used that public key last time but we're going to use a different uh, use that key last time we're going to use a different one this time um, or the server in the very in the third case scenario the server can reject that and say okay last time you used that key but actually I'm no longer accepting it so here's the key you should use that actually kind of regresses back to the first case where it takes one round trip for the before the request can be made which is not so bad a rejected zero round trip handshake gets the uh, request out in still after one round trip okay so quick reduces the time it takes to establish a connection to start sending the application level data worst case is one round trip best case is zero round trips compare that to TCP plus TLS that was two round trips always okay the second problem with HTTP is that establishing multiple streams is ex expensive um, I guess this is more of a problem with HTTP plus TLS so th this is a problem with the old uh, protocol stack um, okay whoops so when you when your web browser makes a request to load a web page uh, you may know this already but basically but there are a lot of, of HTTP requests that are involved like initially you request the HTML of the page and but within that page there are references to many other documents like uh, cascading style sheets as CSS files JavaScript uh, code uh, you might make Ajax requests to get uh, other to get JavaScript responses to get JSON responses or fetch other pieces of HTML and in, in, in general you have a lot of images to load so all of these requests might be going to the same server but there could be tons of them like dozens of them to load a single page and that's a problem because every one of these requests requires its own TCP plus TLS connection and those connections have significant handshake setup latency like we talked about before so um, you know, two round trips to set up a new connection so you either can wait that time you can either create a new connection by waiting two round trips or uh, you can wait you can reuse connections this is commonly done by browsers but you, so you have a pool of connections to a particular server and once a previous request is done uh, HTTP request is done you can send a new request inside the same TCP uh, TLS connection to reuse it um, but the, there's kind of a trade-off here that you don't want you either have a lot of you either have to set up a lot of connections ahead of time and that wastes ports and puts a lot of load on both the client and the server that's not needed or you wait unnecessarily uh, for previous connections to be finished for requests on, on your pool of connections to finish so you can you can reuse them so the speedy protocol in HTTP 2 solve this problem by multiplexing many HTTP connections on a single TCP TLS socket so this the idea was um, why are we making all of these separate TCP TLS connections to the same server to make HTTP requests why don't we just reuse one connection for many requests in parallel okay that's what HTTP 2 does to do this it adds a stream ID to the messages it sends so that you can use a single socket to have um, sort of like a time division multiplexing or of uh, of, of different uh, or it's like packet switching on a connection kind of different chunks of data correspond to different connections on the TCP connection di different TCP different HTTP requests on that single TCP connection and this was a successful uh, development it's it's adoption is widespread HTTP 2 is used in about 50% of web traffic so the benefits seen here were significant in terms of like those the quicker time to uh, 
fetch all these many, to start all these many requests that were needed to load a web page. Okay, so I have a, a diagram in the next slide that shows you how this works. This is the old style. This is HTTP 1.1. We have a single TCP connection established for the initial re HTML request. So we make the request, we get back the HTML. When that comes back, we parse the HTML. We see that there are three other resources we need. So we make three requests to fetch those, those documents. The first document can be can reuse that connection we already established, that first one, but then the next two require new TCP connections, and so that's what's done. And the total time is kind of slow. Okay, this is just going to replay this animated GIF over and over again. With HTTP2, instead, we establish a single TCP connection. So there's one round trip uh, handshake to do that, or I guess two round trips for the TCP plus TLS. And then we send our H all of our requests, we can send multiple requests in that connection. And there's this HTTP2 framing layer that handles like distinguishing which packet, which message goes to um, which HTTP request. So it's kind of like the way that different port numbers are used by the operating system to associate different packets with different TCP streams. Uh, this HTTP2 framing layer is doing the same kind of thing with um, uh, stream numbers, I think is what they call them. So the different colors of, of packet of boxes here correspond to messages that relate to different HTTP requests that are all sent through the same TCP connection. Okay, so one TCP plus TLS connection that's used can be used for an arbitrary number of HTTP requests as long as those requests are going to the same server. That is the case, right? Because we have this one web server that's providing the HTML as well as the images and JavaScript. And the different chunks of the requests and responses are tagged with stream IDs, which in this picture correspond to different colors to allow this um, the receiving application to, to split it up to the corresponding um, HTTP requests and responses. Okay. Another benefit of this besides the lower latency is that you have fewer TCP port numbers that are reserved on the client side uh, for the connection. So the client only has to use one TCP port to make uh, many HTTP requests in parallel. Okay. So this idea um, is useful. Like I said, it was, it's been adopted in um, over 50% of web traffic um, by one measurement. And Quick also does this, but Quick also solves some problems, some performance problems in this solution. So I introduced the solution um, actually to show that there's a problem here that Quick is going to solve. Okay. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. I just want to show uh, another optimization here is called server push with HTTP2. So in this case, when the request is sent to the web server, the web server is intelligent enough to anticipate that certain other requests typically accompany that first request, so that when that request one comes in for the HTML, the web server gives a response for that with the HTML, but also preemptively, predictively, let's say, returns the style sheet and the uh, JavaScript and the image, even though the client has not requested it yet. When the client later browser does later make that HTTP request for the CSS, for the image, and for the JavaScript, the uh, HTTP framing layer will will find that there's a cached response like these these responses here will be cached and ready to to be returned when the client asks for them so that's pretty cool it's called server push um and keep notice that this is only possible because we already have a single tcp we already have a long-lived tcp connection that is designed to be reused for multiple um for multiple requests if we didn't have this, there would be no way really for the server to uh, return these predictive responses back to the client. All right, so here is a slide you can use to compare, you know, the old HTTP 1.1 with HTTP 2. And the thing, we're, the thing we're getting here, again, is that we have a single TCP connection that can be used for multiple concurrent HTTP requests. That means we don't have to use up multiple ports on the client side. We don't have to do multiple TCP plus TLS handshakes to set up these connections, so there's less latency. And um, it also allows the server to predictively send responses for the client to cache for later use. Okay, and this is kind of what it looks like in the end. 
Quick is going to make this even better. Okay. So the problem with this, uh, with HTTP2, that, that, that has been observed, is that it's prone to head of line blocking. Um, so, and this is this is one of those problems where the abstraction we chose, uh, the stream-based abstraction for TCP. Uh, causes a problem for us because we actually want to do something we're, we're using that not as a single stream but as, as multiple streams and, and that, that hurts us okay I'm getting ahead of myself so the problem is that with a TCP stream if a packet is dropped then later packets in the stream aren't delivered until that dropped packet is retransmitted so the out-of-order packets those early packets can be buffered in the receiver the OS can can hold on to them and deliver them later but only after that gap is filled that gap from the dropped packet so the application must receive TCP data in the order that it was sent. That's the, one of the fundamental guarantees and abstractions of TCP. It's a reliable stream. Uh, that's all well and good. But remember that HTTP2 transmits many HTTP requests in a single TCP stream. So this isn't really necessary, and it can, be, it can cause unnecessary delays. So if the dropped, the dropped packet generally involves only one or a subset of the HTTP streams that are using that connection. So it's not necessary to delay all of the stream traffic behind that dropped packet because that traffic behind might be associated with a totally different stream. And so, um, you know, you, you, you have unnecessary delays. And that's called head of line blocking. That thing at the beginning of the, the line, the dropped packet, is um, has to be delivered first, but it's delaying stuff behind it that could go earlier. And I have a, a diagram that shows this in more detail. So head of line blocking is a general problem, and here's a, an example that shows head of line blocking in a switch or router, which is a you know totally different domain, but the same concept head of line blocking uh, applies. So here we have an input ports and output ports, and the input ports have queues. And the numbers shown in this, these queue slots indicate which output port the packet wants to go to, needs to go to. And in this case, we have two uh, queues that have a packet at the head that wants to use, be sent on output one, output four, sorry. So one of these two is gonna have to wait. So let's say that we send um, this packet on input three first. In the meantime, this, this packet here uh, on, on input 1 has to wait. And actually input 1 doesn't make any progress because it's waiting for item 4, this uh, packet that is going to uh, output 4 to be sent. It's waiting. That is head of line blocking because it, the reason it's head of line blocking is because this th these packets be behind it, in particular the one right behind it, can, should, it wants to be sent on output number 3. Output number three is idle right now. There's no reason why we could not take this packet and send it out on port number three, except for the fact that we've designed the system to use queues, first in, first out queues. So the fundamental problem here is that we're using a FIFO queue for items that have no ordering dependency at all. Like for example, uh, this, these input queues are just storing packets that, that, are, that are independent, that need to be sent. Um, but we've enforced this rule that we're going to send them in FIFO order, first in, first out. So a delay of this thing at the head for a reason unrelated to uh, the later items is, a, is an example of head-of-line blocking and at least a suboptimal performance. If we could somehow pick out whatever item is ready to go, whichever item is ready, that would allow this item uh, marked 3 to be sent immediately without waiting for 4 to be sent. And this applies to HTTP2 as well. Okay, so the, the, the FIFO queue we have in this case is the TCP stream itself. So this illustration that I drew um, sloppily, I guess, <laughs> shows a TCP stream from a server to a client. And here are some three different HTTP streams, chunks of data for three streams, stream one, two, and three. And this is all in one TCP connection, and the TCP sequence numbers are shown on the bottom, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. 
So from the client's perspective, because it's a TCP connection, the way TCP works is that the data has to be delivered to the application in that order, two, three, four, five, and six. Now, if one of these segments is lost, so TCP segment three, if that data is lost, that means that these later uh, packets, sequence number four, five, and six, cannot be delivered until segment three is retransmitted. For a uh, typical HTTP version one or 1.1 connection, that's okay because you know this might correspond to this corresponds to data later in the same stream in the same HTTP response, so it doesn't make sense to try to read that earlier. But in this case, since we tried to do something clever with HTTP two and we actually have multiple concurrent responses coming back, actually all of this data is being blocked unnecessarily. We have head of line blocking because this this data that it was delivered that when it is delivered um, is unrelated to that lost that the, the the packet lost for that um, stream number one so stream number one should be delayed and held up by this loss but there's no reason why streams number two and three should be paused just because of a loss related to stream one and so the fundamental problem here is is that we're the abstraction for TCP and the, and the, the behavior of TCP is is doesn't match what we're doing with HTTP2 where we're, we're actually servicing three independent streams on that one uh, reliable TCP stream. Okay. There's no need to wait, but the abstraction provided by TCP forces the wait. And Quick solves this problem because Quick doesn't use TCP, it uses UDP, so we can block things uh, separately. Okay. So. Quick prevents head of line blocking. It coordinates transport and application layers so that Quick can allow the, the HTTP streams that are unaffected by packet loss to continue while delaying those that, that must be delayed. Quick data is sent by UDP, so it's not buffered by the OS before it's delivered. So it's delivered in whatever order it arrives. It's up to the application to decide when to um, what to do with it. Okay. So another way of looking at this is that Quick uses one handshake to support an arbitrary number of independent data streams. Uh, TCP uses one handshake to support one data stream, and it has the data has to be supplied. The OS and TCP implementation force that the data is supplied in the order that it's um, sent, whereas Quick can allow multiple independent um, data streams. Okay. Third problem with the traditional uh, web stack is that HTTP headers are, are kind of inefficient. This is not the most important problem, but it's, it's a problem that Quick solves. So he, it, we know that HTTP has human readable headers. Um, for example, if you look at a TCP, uh, an HTTP uh, request or response, I guess, you, would, you might see something like content dash length colon space and then a number. This is like the size of the response. This term content length is 16 bytes or 120 bits. So 120 bits to represent something that is present in like, every single response. So DNS does has a totally different approach. DNS is really very space efficient, <clears throat> uses UDP usually, so it, it tries to fit everything into one packet. And you determine the, me the meaning of numbers and values based on their position in the, uh, in the packet, more so than like these, these human readable labelings. So this HTTP approach is really not meant to be efficient, it's meant to be like simple and easy to debug and easy to use and easy to program for. Um, but these these big headers are kind of a problem as, especially as web traffic has started to have more headers, more cookies, things like that, more caching headers. Um, the HTTP body in the response has a solution to this uh, problem. So like, like HTML is a very common type of document that's returned. HTML also is human readable, and that's inefficient by nature because it's uh, you're using ASCII characters, which is a, a very small subset of the uh, bits you have available to represent data. But you can use gzip compression or similar kind of compression to make the body of the re response smaller. But the headers need to be in HTTP, sorry, the headers in HTTP need to be always plain ASCII text because you don't have some uh, 
there's no way like the body of a message can be compressed if there's a content encoding header that specifies the type of compression that's used you don't have such a header above the header before the headers to tell you how to uh, decompress the header okay. uh, and a lot of the headers specifying client capabilities or server capabilities are repeated in every new request to the server and response from the server and the reason why there's so much repetition in HTTP headers is that HTTP is designed to be stateless. So every request should be self-sufficient, right? You, don't, you shouldn't have to remember what you got in the previous request to serve the current request. So HTTP headers are big and inefficient. Quick has a solution, which is to compress headers using a scheme called QPAC. So basically, they just define ahead of time that all headers are going to be compressed in a certain way. The downside of this is that we lose human readability. You can no longer like just open up Telnet and type out an HTTP request and have it work. That doesn't work. That uh, HTTP over Quick uh, or HTTP three, as it's called, doesn't really do that. So you ha if you want to debug uh, this web traffic, you have to use a tool like Wireshark, which knows how to um, decompress the headers and and figure out what the different parts are, and it presents it to you in a um, a user-friendly manner, so, sort of similar to how uh, you would debug DNS. De debugging DNS manually by looking at the packet bytes is it would be a pain because of the uh, space-efficient compression uh, or encoding that it uses. But if you open up a DS, if you look at a DNS packet in Wireshark, it's very clear to see what's happening because Wireshark has the you know code that that, de that de knows what rules to use to decode the packet to present it to you in a human readable um, user-friendly manner. The fourth problem that Quick solves is uh, mobility, which of course we talked about last time. Um, in a mobile world, IP addresses change. So um, if mobile radios often are shut off. That disconnects TCP connections. Mobile devices may, might rejoin the network with a different IP address. That also will, will uh, disrupt a TCP connection, and TCP connection requires the same IP address to continue. What Quick does is actually separates the idea of a connection from an IP address. So Quick has unique connection IDs. So if a device moves, like let's say from cellular to Wi-Fi, its IP address is definitely going to change. Um, it, unless somehow your Wi-Fi connection is from the same company as your cellular and it's, and it's managed the same, but like that's really unrealistic. Generally, your IP address is always going to change if you go from cellular data to Wi-Fi on a, on a smartphone. Um, but Quick, because it doesn't rely on those to identify connections, it has this connection ID instead. It can resume a connection, like if you're streaming a YouTube video, um, it can resume that as you make the transition from cellular to Wi-Fi using that same Quick connection ID on a different IP address and also a different UDP port. So neither that neither the UDP port nor the IP address um, defines the connection. Instead, there's this third thing called a connection ID, which can be consistent even when your IP address changes. So the end result is that a connection can continue even if um, the client IP address changes. That's pretty cool. Now, um, it, all that is good, but we don't, you know, whenever we design new network protocols, we want to respect backward compatibility as much as possible in order to like get widespread adoption without causing uh, a lot of pain for people who want to do the upgrades, right? So, HTTP <coughs> Quick Quick is is compatible with the old stack of HTTP 1.1 and TCP or HTTP 2 uh, and TCP in the sense that any any HTTP over Quick or HTTP three request can be translated into an equivalent HTTP one point one request, and you can set up a reverse proxy or load balancer in front of your old web server. So if your old web server, like let's say this is a custom application that you've developed in I don't know Java or whatever, uh, and you don't want to re this is the code that that serves your website. Uh, it's been going for five years. It works great. Um, you don't want to have to like move to a new web server or, or change it just because there's this fancy new protocol that solves some client side efficiency problems. So what, what you can do in that case is stick in front of your web server another HTTP 
um, server, which is going to be act as a reverse proxy. So this this new web server is going to support HTTP three or Quick, and the clients will do quick handshakes and make qu quick style um, HTTP three web requests to it, and then that reverse proxy will translate that into an equivalent request that's compatible with HTTP one point one, and get the response and and translate the response back. Okay, so. Uh, for software that's used for this purpose, for example, uh, Nginx is a is a common reverse proxy. You also, I mean, these things are commonly used for caching and load balancing anyway. It's very common to have a uh, some kind of a front end layer in front of your your actual web server. These are often also used for what's for TLS termination. So you you can install your uh, TLS certificate on this front end reverse proxy and not have to install it on your web server. And so that you'll have encrypted connections between the client and your front end, and then a non-encrypted connection on the back end side. That's another common uh, approach that already has been done for many years. You just so you just need to upgrade this reverse proxy up front, which is not your code. Um, you know, if you're a software developer, this is like off-the-shelf software like Nginx. Okay. So just a quick kind of quiz to see if you're following along. Uh, what what port? type and number is being used by the client. What port type? Is it TCP or is it UDP up here? Well, it's actually making a quick connection and the, the ser server it's connecting to is using UDP, so the client must be using UDP. Some random port number. What about on the backend side between the, the proxy and the web server? What port type is, is uh, on this side of the connection and what port number? Well, again, it has to be compatible with the port on the other port type on the other side, which is TCP. So the quick reverse proxy is making a TCP connection and an HTTP 1.1 request, which has to be served on top of TCP. The, the port number would be like random, different for all the different requests it's making. Yep. Okay. So that was quick. Here's some references that I use to develop this content, and um, you can read any of it if you want to learn more. You know, again, this is a relatively recent development, so it's kind of exciting. It's not in the book, uh, but I thought it would be a good way to wrap up all the content of the class and to get you thinking about like more advanced networking performance issues uh, aside from just the basics of getting things working, which is kind of what we talked about so far in the class. So to recap that, um, the networking stack is layered for historical reasons and for simplicity, but... Um, that layering and really, in general, any abstractions we have in software or technology have limitations. That's also true of TCP. And Quick was kind of a brave effort to move away from TCP, um, uses UDP instead to give fine grain control over retransmission and like separation of streams. Uh, so it combines the transport and application layer, HTTP and, and TCP and, and TLS, the encryption part, which we didn't talk so much about, but that, that's definitely a part of it. Um, it's replaced by one kind of application library. And it's based on modern assumptions about networks. So for example, everything is encrypted. Encryption is standard. That's a, a, a modern assumption, right? In the past, that wasn't true. But once that becomes true, then we know now, okay, we're making two handshakes instead of one. Why are we doing that? Um, quick solves that. Loading a website requires many HTTP requests. So maybe we should have a way to be able to send many, fetch many documents from one connection instead of having all these parallel connections because connections have overhead. Um, round trip times are dominant factor in network performance. So if we're making two round trips to establish a connection, we need to really think hard about finding a better way to do that. And finally, devices move. They, they can switch IP addresses. Um, there, we don't really have a great solution on the IP address side. I know we talked about mobile IP, but that's not um, super well adopted. So Quick provides a, an alternative way to support, you know, a connection uh, handing off a, a, a web connection, like an HTTP connection, handing off between uh, different IP addresses. So if you enjoyed the content of this class, this is the end of the class, believe it or not. Um, there are other classes you can take at Northwestern that are listed here. I teach the CS310 class on scalable software architectures. The first three are explicitly about networking. The second three are related to networking, but not exclusively about networking. 
And finally, um, if you really want to learn a lot more, then you should check out the latest networking research. And uh, fortunately, it, it, there's an easy way to do that, which is to check out just one conference. SIGCOM is what it's called. And the SIGCOM conference is like very prestigious, and it's held every year. And you can find online a list of papers, articles that were published, you know, presentations that were made at this conference by the leading networking researchers around the world, including some at Northwestern. And um, it covers a wide range of topics, all within networking. Kind of. So if you've taken this class, I think you can, if you load one of these papers, download one of these papers, and read the abstract, you should be able, and, and start reading the introduction, you should be able to kind of follow along um, for most of them at some level, maybe with some background um, reading. But but yeah, I think I think you're ready for that if you want to learn more about networking. And of course, you can also talk to the uh, networking faculty at Northwestern that, that do research and, and try to get involved in, in, in their stuff. So thank you for joining me through this uh, voyage. I hope you found it um, interesting, as, as I do. And I hope to see you again uh, later.